My name is Todd Kimball. I'll be the MC today. Happy Super Bowl Sunday to everyone. Now our reader, Dave Pebworth. Okay, this is from the power of worshipers inside the dangerous rise of the religious nationalism by Catherine Stewart. For a long, for too long now, Americans Christian nationalist movement has been misunderstood and underestimated. Most Americans continue to see it as a cultural movement centered on a set of social issues such as abortion and same sex marriage, preoccupied with symbolic conflicts over monuments and prayers. But the religious the religious right has become more focused and powerful, even as it is, is arguably less representative. It is not a social or cultural movement. It is a political movement and its ultra, ultimate goal is power. It does not seek to add another voice to America's pluralistic democracy, but to replace our foundational democratic principles and institutions with a state grounded on a particular version of Christianity, answering to what some adherents call a biblical worldview that also happens to serve the interest of its plutocratic funders and allied political leaders. The movement is unlikely to realize its most extreme visions, but it has already succeeded in degrading our politics and dividing the nation with religious animus. This is not a culture war. It is a political war over the future of democracy. Political movements are by their nature complex creatures, and this one is more complex than most. It is not organized around any single central institution. It consists rather of a dense ecosystem of nonprofit, for profit, religious, and non religious media and legal advocacy groups, some relatively permanent, others fleeting. Its leadership cadre includes a number of personally interconnected activists and politicians who often jump from one organization to the next. It derives much of its power and direction from an informal club of funders, a number of them belonging to extended hyper wealthy families like Betsy DeVos. It took me some time to navigate the sea of acronyms, funding schemes, denominations and policy and kinship networks. And I will lay out much of this ecosystem in this book. Yet the important thing to understand about the collective effort is not its evident variety, but the profound source of its unity. There is a movement that has come together around what its leaders see as absolute truth and what the rest of us may see as partisan agitation. Names matter, so I will take a moment here to lay out some of the terms of my investigation. Christian nationalism is not a religious creed, but in any view, a, but in my view, a political ideology. It promotes the myth that the American Republic was founded on it as a Christian nation. It asserts that legitimate government rests not on the consent of the governed, but uh, on adherence to the doctrines of a specific religious, ethnic, and cultural heritage. It demands that our laws be based not on the reasoned deliberation of our democratic institutions, but on particular idiosyncratic interpretations of the Bible. Its defining fear is that the nation has strayed from the truths that once made it great. Christian nationalism looks backward on a fictionalized history of Americans' allegedly Christian founding. It looks forward to a future in which its versions of the Christian religion and its adherents, along with their political allies, enjoy positions of exceptional privilege and power in government and in law. The Power Worshippers by Catherine Stewart. Few people have had the varied life of dedicated public service of Kerry Timchuk. He serves as the executive director of the Oregon Historical Society. Founded in 1898, OHS includes a world-class museum and research library and is the designated steward of Oregon's history. Kerry has been named the Portland Business Journal's most admired nonprofit executive in Portland and is a past recipient of the prestigious Oregon Statesman of the Year Award. Kerry is also a recipient of the Liberty Award presented by the Oregon League of Minority Voters in recognition of outstanding contributions 
on behalf of all people of color. A native of Reedsport, Oregon, Carrie is a graduate of Willamette University and Willamette College of Law. Prior to assuming the helm at OHS in April of 2011, Carrie earned a bipartisan reputation as one of Oregon's most respected public servants. He has been a speechwriter for Bob and Elizabeth Dole and has served as chief of staff to US Senator Gordon Smith. By appointment of three Oregon governors, Carrie has previously served on the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission, the Oregon State Fair Council, and as chairman of the Oregon Lottery Commission. For good measure, Kerry is also a four-time champion on the TV show Jeopardy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning on Super Bowl Sunday and the day before Oregon's birthday, of course, uh, an important day at OHS. Uh, tomorrow, February 14th, uh, will be our 163rd birthday. Oregon became a state in uh, 1859. And so we are having a big weekend down at OHS. Usually our tradition, of course, is to have a huge public event when the governor's there and we have cake to serve to everybody. But as, as you know, has been the case the last two years, COVID has changed that just a bit. And, but we're still free all weekend, uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, courtesy of a nice gift from Reese's Fine Foods. And we've got a scavenger hunt going for kids and they can win prizes. So uh, it's, it's always a good time to go to OHS, but this, this weekend, especially. And appreciate the chance to talk to you about uh, Oregon Historical Society, what we've got going on down there. I hope that many of you are fans and, and frequent visitors. Uh, we have been uh, around since 1898. Uh, next year, we'll celebrate our 125th anniversary. Uh, we, and our mission is to preserve our state's history and to make it accessible to everyone in ways that advance knowledge and inspire curiosity about all the people, places, and events that have shaped Oregon. Uh, every state has an equivalent of us, OHS. Uh, most of the states, they are actually government agencies. If I were in Idaho or Washington, I'd be a state employee and the Historical Society would be funded by tax dollars. And we have always been a 501c3 ever since we were founded in 1898. The state has usually, uh, but not always recognized that if not for us, they would have to do some of what we're doing. So every biennium we get an appropriation from the state. And, and here in Multnomah County, uh, as you um, hope you know, in two, 2010, uh, the voters passed a levy, a small levy, uh, that provides funding to OHS and to four East County Historical Societies. And in return, all Multnomah County residents have free admission every day of the year to OHS. Uh, that was, levy was renewed in 2016 and renewed uh, last year, overwhelmingly, 80% uh, vote to renew that again for another five years. So we're very appreciative of the support of Multnomah County and uh, we also operate as the Multnomah County Historical Society as well and keep uh, those records at OHS. I've got a little slideshow here to kind of give you an example of uh, all the stuff we're doing and then look forward to some good questions and answers uh, and talk about the different roles we play. And the first role we play, David will bring up, go ahead, David, hopefully this will work. There it is. Uh, yeah. So that is uh, on the screen there. The first thing we are, of course, one of the things we are, roles we play is a museum. And on that uh, page, that is a picture of the in, of inside our Experience Oregon exhibit. Uh, this is our showcase exhibit, our signature exhibit that all the visitors go through and that all the school kids, when they had many, many school tours, and hopefully those will be back again on, you know, in the fall, this, this coming fall. It's our exhibit that uh, brand new, two years old, uh, won several national awards this past year uh, as one of the best new exhibits in the country. Uh, covering the whole Oregon story from, uh, you know, the, our geology to, to present day. It is very open and honest uh, in the exhibit about, about Oregon history. As, as I say, um, we are not the Chamber of Commerce and we're not the Tourism Bureau. Those, those organizations have their job. We are the Historical Society and our job is to tell the true history of Oregon, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're very upfront in this exhibit about about some of the ugly uh, history. Uh, so I'd encourage you all, if you haven't seen Experience Oregon, uh, to come on down. It's, uh, you could spend uh, a whole day in it and still not, not see it all. We also have temporary exhibits that change out you know, two to three to four times a year. 
And the next slide, what we have now, one of our temporary exhibits is, there you go. That one. Freeze the day, a history of winter sports in Oregon. Uh, ideally timed, you know, to be during the Winter Olympics. And so uh, Oregon's got a rich, rich history of winter sports, of skiing and snowshoeing, hockey, uh, ice skating. We, we talk in the exhibit uh, about uh, the Portland Rosebuds, who were the predecessors of the Buckaroos and the Winterhawks. In 1916, uh, the Rosebuds played in the very first Stanley Cup, losing to the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, we also touch upon uh, Tanya Harding, of course. We've got uh, information about skiing and uh, ice skating, a really fun, fun exhibit. And there in the bottom right, you can see, we, you can actually uh, have a snowflake melt in your hand, which is what the, the kids have been enjoying that. We also have an exhibit now, next slide, is, um, it says coming soon, it's already open, as you can see on January 14th. Frances Stilwell is a wonderful painter, a woman from Corvallis, who has spent a good share of her adult life uh, painting the, the botanical landscape of Oregon, the flora and fauna of Oregon. She paints outdoors. Uh, she just recently donated 80 of her paintings uh, to us. And it's a beautiful uh, display of the different eco, eco regions of Oregon. And so that is uh, up in one of our, our main level galleries. It's a nice place to forget about the, the worries of the day and to, and to see the beautiful landscapes. And then the next slide, uh, some other exhibits that are up in our museum coming soon. Uh, we just opened up in conjunction with a group called Jobs with Justice, uh, an exhibit on their 30th anniversary, Building Solidarity for 30 Years, Portland Jobs with Justice, which tells the story of the labor movement here in Oregon and Portland over the last 30 years. Uh, coming soon, an exhibit we'll do in partner with Morrison Child and Family Services, one of the wonderful nonprofits here in social service agencies here in Portland, an exhibit on celebrating their 75 years of service. And another small exhibit on now, uh, Brave in the Attempt, celebrating 50 years of Special Olympics Oregon. This is the 50th anniversary of Special Olympics Oregon, one of the really uh, you know, outstanding uh, nonprofits here in Oregon. I was proud to be chairman of the board for a number of years of Special Olympics and partnered with them to tell, to tell their story. And then uh, one more exhibit coming soon. We, we love these little anniversary exhibits we do in partner in the Blanche House, uh, one of Portland's earliest soup kitchens. Uh, we're telling their story of how they've impacted and changed futures for the last 70 years. We also, uh, as the big boy on the block, uh, you know, every county as a little historical society, uh, we like to provide some, some uh, programs and exhibits for them. And we have traveling exhibits, uh, one up now, uh, as you can see at Portland State, and it'll be moving to Umatilla County. And we also have it, we made two copies of it. We also have it in our, or in our pavilion. Uh, this is the centennial year of Mark Hatfield, certainly the, um, the gold standard of public servants in Oregon. He would, would have turned 100 this coming July. So we're celebrating the Hatfield Centennial in a number of ways, including with this uh, big exhibit, trifold exhibit that's up in our pavilion and that is now uh, traveling the state. It's booked from now through July at different libraries and historical societies and civic centers around the state. We also have a traveling exhibit called Oregon is Indian Country that we did in conjunction with Oregon's nine federally recognized tribes. You can see it's down in, uh, in uh, Gold Beach at the Curry Public Library. And then we also have an exhibit. This is the 50th anniversary this year of the Bottle Bill. Uh, Oregon's one of the key pieces of environmental legislation. And we have a traveling exhibit that is now out in uh, Dallas until uh, it ends on Monday. Uh, and then they'll be traveling around the state from there. So we take seriously our role as the Oregon Historical Society. We are not the Portland Historical Society or the Tri-County Historical Society. We do our best to uh, have programs, exhibits around the state. We are also, of course, a world-class research library. Uh, this is again a, a data slide. It, it, the, it was closed for, uh, we did a massive reconstruction of it. It had been 50 years since anything had been done. And now it's a world-class and newly updated world research library. It opened last February, last, excuse me, October 15th. 
Um, so some pro COVID protocols still going on, so we require appointments, but that's going to end soon uh, as far as requiring appointments. Lots of researchers, students, scholars uh, use our research library. It, we have the largest collection of organ related material in the world. Uh, interestingly, a lot of folks recently have been doing what I call house history or house genealogy. They buy a house over at you know, 1362 uh, Hawthorne or something, and they come in and ask to search our files for photographs of the neighborhood or records or blueprints of their house even. And so we've got a great staff of research librarians who are able to, to help. So I uh, would encourage you to come up to the research library if you're, if you're interested in it. Um, and the next slide, what we, uh, our, our website, uh, we are, you know, we're an in-person museum and in-person library, but a very robust uh, array of activities and uh, information that you can find online at www.ohs.org. Uh, for if you're a student, if you're a scholar, if you're just somebody interested in Oregon history, uh, there's so much you can find uh, on our website. It includes, as you can see there, the Oregon Encyclopedia, which is a, uh, it's essentially Wikipedia for all things Oregon. Only the articles are, are peer reviewed and you know that they're factual and true history. The Oregon Hist History Project, uh, more information you can find online. And of course, the Great Oregon Historical Quarterly, which has been published uh, by us uh, for a hundred years, four times a year. Um, thank you uh, there, Ingrid, for putting that on there. And uh, great articles in, in, the, in the OHQ, each and, every, each and every issue. We also, the next slide, you can see we provide uh, curriculum to our, to our schools. Uh, when, you know, as with students being unable to come in on school field trips this last year and a half, we've taken history to them. Uh, working with teachers to provide curriculum on, on history. It, it wouldn't surprise you to know that I think history gets a short shrift in our schools. You know, it's so much about math and science and STEM, you know, science, tech, engineering, math, and history is so important. And so we reach out to schools and school teachers and provide them with different curriculum. Uh, nevertheless, they persisted. You see mentioned there, that was a wonderful exhibit we had uh, last year on the history of women's suffrage in Oregon. Uh, Experience Oregon curriculum is lessons from our, our current exhibit. And Racing to Change curriculum is an exhibit we did in conjunction with a group called Oregon Black Pioneers telling the history of African-Americans uh, here in Oregon and provide curriculum on that as well. We're also the sponsors. You can see the next slide of Oregon History Day. Uh, this is kind of like this National Spelling Bee. There's a National History Day and we manage the Oregon contest and then students uh, in prior years and hopefully again, uh, we, we send the winners back to the Washington DC for the national competition. The last two years, uh, in 2020 and 2021, and this year again, uh, they're all virtual. Uh, the contests are virtual and the national competition is virtual. And Oregon has actually had a, some national winners in the past couple of years. So we are, we're really excited about uh, History Day and every year it has a different theme. And you can see this year's theme is debate, debate and diplomacy in, or in Oregon. And a little recruiting here, the next slide. We can use some judges. Uh, there's some information there about uh, it's you know, it's just very inspiring to see what these these kids, junior high and high school, are doing on different projects, including documentaries and displays and papers. There's some information there on how to uh, if you'd like to be a, a judge uh, and how to volunteer. You can find I think more information uh, on our website. Uh, there you can see. Please have interested folks reach out. At uh, her name is is right there. So. Would love to have, uh, if you're interested, then you can see the, the information there is what the time commitment that's needed. Some, some fun little numbers here about our, our web site. You can see this was in January. We had 33,000 visitors uh, to our OHS uh, website, ohs.org, 63% uh, over last year. We are finding in, in these historic times that people wanna know more about history. Um, and look at the Oregon Encyclopedia, 98,000, almost 99,000 visitors uh, in January, over a million a year visiting the Oregon Encyclopedia. Just do different dives, uh, uh, different topics. Uh, I always like to see what's the most looked at thing. And you can see in the next page, um, 
There you are, the most viewed pages on our website in January, this past January. Number one, what we can learn from the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919. And that was first posted uh, in April of 20, almost two years ago. And it still gets that many views uh, in a month, people wanting to know more information about uh, the pandemic of a century ago. And now um, the Hatfield Historians Forum, it's our signature lecture program. We have four historians every year uh, that we, of course, bring out in COVID, it was Zoom, uh, but they're back in, in person. On February 1, we had our first in-person one and in two years with Eric Logoval, Pulitzer Prize winner discussing his great biography of John Kennedy. On March 1, at the Schnitz, we have Eric Larson, a fabulous author in his book uh, about Churchill, The Splendid and the Vile. Churchill's first year in office as prime minister. And he wrote, of course, The Devil in the White City um, and uh, other wonderful books, a very popular historian. Heather Cox Richardson, number four there, is going to be one of our upcoming Hatfield speakers. She is the most followed historian in America today uh, on, her, you know, on her website and on her tweets. Uh, so uh, a great historian. And you can see other... Uh, it's the Fred Meyer story, number nine, uh, we, we've got a whole uh, page on our website devoted to the history of Fred Meyer. Uh, and every new employee at Fred Meyer is required to, uh, to read, read the information we have at OHS. And the next slide, this is a fun one. These are the top 15 entries on the Oregon Encyclopedia for all of last year. And look at number one, Bigfoot, the entry on Sasquatch on Bigfoot is the number one entry, uh, which just is so, so entertaining to see. Uh, number two, Oregon Trail, that's always in the top 10. Um, Black Exclusion Laws, the entry on that. Animal House, the movie, the classic movie that was filmed, of course, in Eugene and Springfield. Uh, and you can see other rattlesnakes is a popular entry every, every month. And you can see other entries uh, there. But Bigfoot, month after month, year after year, you can always count on the Bigfoot entry being the first or second uh, entry on the most visited entry on the Oregon Encyclopedia. We also just opened up um, our museum collection portal. Perhaps you saw some of the press on it. Also on uh, our accessible on our website. Uh, we have some 85,000 items in our collection, artifacts in our collection. And we have started with 10,000 of the items are on our museum collection portal. We can access them, see high resolution images of them, read about them, read about their provenance and their historical importance. Uh, it's really, again, a great way to spend a weekend is diving down some rabbit holes of, some, of, our, of our museum collection. And just a few numbers there and how many people visited uh, on, the first, on the first week of, uh, of our museum collection portal being open. And yes, you can see in the next slide, most of our visitors are from Oregon. But uh, we had visitors, uh, our digital collections visiting in 2021 from 154 countries and all 50 states, plus the District of Columbia, with Oregon, Washington, and California being the, the most frequent visitors. 139 different cities and communities in Oregon, people in those communities visiting our digital collection. Some of the really popular ones there of our, of our digital collection, uh, glass negatives of early port and residential scenes, that, uh, the Oregonian did a fascinating story about that, which led to outpouring of people visiting the collection, looking at pictures, finding their neighborhoods, people identifying their houses where they, they live now. Uh, Glappen uh, Oral Histories, that is the Gay Lesbian Archive. Uh, we have their, we keep their archive for them uh, at uh, OHS. Vanport Photographs, The Exploding Whale, uh, of course, the famous exploding whale down in Florence. 2021 was the 50th anniversary of the whale. Uh, we did a, a, a program uh, that broke all records of, uh, actually it was 2020 was, was the year that broke all records of visitors to our website. People from around the world fascinating with Paul, with the exploding whale that Paul Lindman of course was, became famous for uh, covering live, uh, blasted bits of blubber as he said back then. And other items that are in our, our fabulous digital collection there. I mentioned the OHQ. Uh, the next slide has the one that is currently out now that came out in January. It's a special issue, several years in the making. 
covering the history of the Chinese diaspora in Oregon, which is the Chinese people, the Chinese population in Oregon. Uh, this follows to one we did two years ago, which uh, sold out on the history of white supremacy in Oregon, a special issue covering that topic. Uh, this one is some uh, gentleman just came in yesterday and bought 150 copies of this, a, a Chinese American gentleman, and he wanted to share it with all his uh, his friends and colleagues and uh, is sending it around everywhere. Uh, a really fascinating, fascinating issue. Uh, the Chinese population has been in Oregon since before statehood. Uh, and at, at a time in the early 20th century, Portland had the second largest Chinatown in the country. One of the items that is, uh, I've gotten the most questions about this past year and a half is the African-American Heritage Bicentennial Commemorative Quilt. As you might recall, this was taken, stolen from OHS uh, back in October of 2020 when we were vandalized, when all our windows were broken uh, during parts of the, you know, the riots that were going on in Portland. Uh, they took this quilt, which had been uh, quilted by 12 African-American women back in 1976 to honor African-American heroes. It was left out in the rain uh, the police thankfully found it and returned it. Um, it was damaged, uh, obviously, by, from the rain. Uh, we had to send it to a conservator back east. It has now been returned to us. Uh, as it says, look out for an upcoming blog post for more information. It is uh, not the same. You know, it, it, the, the, the colors ran. It's been damaged. Uh, it was returned to as good as condition as we can get it, but that the damage to it will be part of the story, part of its history, its provenance of, uh, of the quilt and what happened to it in, in the history of Oregon. I think that is the last slide. Uh, and uh, look at all the questions that are that are coming in. So I used to take my students there and received one. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie, for the beautiful tour today and the outstanding work that OHS is doing thanks to your leadership. And uh, they play such a critical role in our state's history and our fabric of Oregon. So thank you so much, beautiful presentation today. And I would be uh, remiss in my job, you know, malpractice if I didn't urge everyone, if you're not a member, uh, you become a member of OHS. It is uh, reasonably priced. Of course, if you live in Multnomah County, you get a discount because part of membership is free admission. And since Multnomah County residents already have free admission, uh, that we discount it. But you also receive all the mailings, the, the Oregon Historical Quarterly as part of the membership, uh, early access to tickets to our half field lecture series and our other programs. And I'll go ahead and get the questions started today. Um, <clears throat> as we've seen, people not only have a different interpretation of the presence, but also a very different interpretation of history. And I'm just wondering, talk about the process for how things are displayed and how things are written at OHS. Well, they're uh, you know, displayed very, very carefully. We take seriously our, you know, our stewardship of these artifacts. Uh, we have an 800,000 square foot warehouse in Gresham, uh, the Oregon vault, we call it where we keep the vast majority of our collection. Of course, we, with that many items, we can't possibly display, you know, even, you know, a sliver of them. Uh, it's a, you know, state-of-the-art, climate-controlled uh, warehouse where we, where we keep uh, things ranging from the, the control panel of the Trojan nuclear plant uh, to a horse-drawn hearse, uh, from the, without the horse, of course, to, uh, you know, you name it, uh, we've got it. If, uh, if it has anything to do with, with Oregon history, um, the exhibits, of course, you, you know, you, when you have exhibits, you're dealing with an audience from eight to 80 from years old and, you know, nine to 90 years old. So they have to be written in, you know, languages and, and or in a style that it can be understood uh, by, by people of all ages. Uh, and again, our, our duty, our mission is to tell the true history of Oregon, uh, to make sure uh, what we're saying is exactly what, what happened. Okay, uh, Joyce has a question about attending the Oregon Speaker Series. Um, Joyce, did you, did you want to unmute for that? Or okay, it looks like Joyce is unmuting. Um, I'm fascinated by some of your speakers, and I'm wondering, are those going to be in person, and they're also going to be on Zoom? And if they're in person, will people be masked? How is that going to work? Yes, good good question. We uh, we just uh, the Hatfield Series was virtual in 2020 and 2021. 
we put our toe back in the water on February 1. Uh, we had our first one, as I said, at the Schnitz. But you can buy a ticket any number of ways. You can attend in person. And under, at the Schnitz, of course, uh, the guidelines are in effect. You need to show proof of vaccination and be masked. And, but you can also buy a ticket to, to watch it live streamed uh, as, as it happens live or to watch a recording uh, within the next two weeks after the lecture. You can watch it in the comfort of your own home in your pajamas if you, if you want to, you know, at any hour of the day. So, and I think that's a lot of organizations have found out during COVID, of course, that people appreciate um, not having to schlep down to an auditorium or a theater to, to see something uh, in, in person. Uh, and in many ways, the, the COVID situation has made us more the Oregon Historical Society. Because people from Brookings or Astoria or Pendleton or Bend or Medford or Eugene, they can attend our Hatfield Lecture Series without having to drive to Portland, which frankly they weren't doing anyway. Uh, it was a largely Portland area audience. So uh, in the future, I think it's always gonna be you know, this way now that you'll have the ability to, some people love to see it in person. We have a reception with the author afterwards where they can get their book signed. Uh, but some people like the, like the ease of being able to watch it uh, from their living room. Okay, and Al Christians, the humanist with the ironic name is known for his contentious, <laughs> sometimes difficult questions. I'm ready. He asks, can you give us any major examples from Oregon history of Oregonians actually learning something important from history? Oh boy. Uh... Well, I like to think that we are, we've all learned something. Uh, Oregon was, let, let me be very clear. Uh, Oregon has a very rocky uh, relationship when it has to do with, with race relations. When we came into the union in 1859 as the 33rd state, we came in as the only state before then and the only state since then that came into the union with a state constitution that actually specifically banned blacks from living in that state. Now it was never really enforced to the letter of the law because it was blatantly unconstitutional to the US constitution, but it remained in the Con Oregon constitution until the early 1920s, uh, sending that message. Imagine if you were an African-American who had the means and motivation to move west from the south or midwest or east, and you looked at, a, and you looked at your options, and here was a state that actually in the constitution banned you from living in that state. Um, it has a, a great deal to do with why Oregon had for so, so many years, such a minuscule African-American population uh, because of the history of, of racism here in Oregon. Uh, there was also, uh, of course, racism towards uh, Asian Americans, towards Chinese, towards Japanese Americans, as we saw in Pearl Harbor, after Pearl Harbor with the uh, internment. And of course, the whole treatment of indigenous people of Native Americans. Uh, I would like to think we've, we've learned from that. Have we reached uh, nirvana and perfection? Certainly not. But uh, I think uh, we've, de uh, we've definitely made, of course, many, many improvements. Uh, and when it comes to uh, you know, dealing certainly with uh, the, our environment, uh, you know, the history of logging, clear cutting, logging, the history of uh, some abuse that was done to the land over the years. And clearly we've learned for that over the years and, and gained your reputation as one of the most green states and environmentally conscious states in the country. So, uh, you know, the, the old saying that those who, not, who do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we're not repeating some of the, the bad history. And we've had some people come through our experience of Oregon exhibit and walk out and say, you know, this, this makes me feel guilty for being a white man. And our response is that, you know, you, you are not responsible for what happened 100 years ago or 150 years ago, but you're responsible for knowing what happened those years ago and how it continues to impact history today, the ripples that it continues to have. We have a very personal question from Nada. I have my grandmother's baby dress. She was born in 1904 and my mother's baby dress born in 1924, both of which I've framed. I don't know what will happen to them after I'm gone. Are these things OHS would take? We, we I mean, I would assume that they are, were born in Oregon or from Oregon provenance. We, frankly, we have a quite a large collection of uh, women's attire from that time, pioneer women's attire. Uh, I would suspect that we probably have uh, 
enough in our collection, but uh, I would I can certainly inquire for you. I'm, uh, our museum team is kind of the ex the expert on that, and I let them. Uh, they know they know what we have in the provenance. We're all, we all, we're always looking for. Uh, frankly, what we're lacking of is what they tell me is like men's dungarees from those days, the pioneer days, and shortly after because they wore their clothes so they disintegrated. We have a lot of a lot of nice you know fine women's attire from from the time period, uh, but very little uh, like men's work clothes from the time period. Okay, we have a clarification. Clarification question from Jerry on one of the slides. He says the debate program needs judges. The slide said April 2021. What is this year's date for orientation? Oop, that was a that was a typo on the slide. It should have been uh, you know 20, 2022. So okay, thank so you. For, April... Thank you for catching that. I will make sure that they. Uh... Oh, here it is. I'm I'm I'm, I'm on it. It says. Uh... Yeah, April 30th, 2022 is what the slide says. Okay, uh, now we have a question from John Tellia and he'll unmute for that. I'm wondering, uh, I work for Providence and uh, there's just kind of been a revisitation of their history because they were started by the nuns Correct. and um, really kind of re-looking at how they treated indigenous people. And so I'm kind of wondering, uh, and, and Providence is going through their history and kind of recreating, you know, retelling the story, acknowledging some of the tragedies that the nuns did to indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's ever a time where, um, not that the history changes, but uh, different uh, artifacts are, are looked through a different lens or maybe a, a revisitation to some of the exhibits um, as uh, conversations around oh, indigenous people or race relations uh, occur in the society? Good question, and absolutely. The, our old permanent exhibit, the one that had been there from, I think, the early 80s to when we changed this one, was much more kind of your grandfather's Oregon history and not as inclusive uh, storytelling. And so when we when we put the new exhibit in, we worked very closely with the nine tribes in Oregon to make sure we were telling their story correctly. And the one request that they all had almost uniformly was basically, look, you know, we know we're at the beginning of the exhibit because we were here first. And in the first item you see when you go into the exhibit are the, a pair of the Fort Rock sandals, which were discovered at a dig in uh, Southern Oregon and carbon dated to over 9,000 years old. So, you know, you know, indigenous people have been here since time immemorial, as they say. So, so they said, look, we know we're at the beginning of the exhibit, but we're still here. And there's so many museums in the West where there are the Indians, here come the pioneers and cowboys, and there go the Indians, and you never see them again. So throughout this exhibit, we return again and again to the Native American story, the indigenous person story about what's happening to them in the history from the, the schools that they were, you know, ripped out of their schools and forced to assimilate and, you know, and Caucasian schools and then the wars against them. And so, uh, and where they are today. So you're, you're exactly right. Great, great question. Uh, this, the new exhibit we just did is completely, uh, you know, updated with more relevant and accurate history and not just looking at history from one viewpoint. The next the, is a, a similar was, question from Jamila. Does OHS provide curriculum materials to schools regarding Native American history of the area? Yeah, yes, yes, we do. In fact, uh, the Portland Public Schools recently reached out to us. Uh, they wanted to do a new third grade reader on, on Portland history, and they turned to us and asked us to do it. It gave us a contract, knowing that we are the experts of history, to write a textbook uh, for third grade readers. And of course, that includes a great deal of the, the people who were here first. Uh, the indigenous people so okay we have a question from david denucci that he will unmute for so i had been into the, to to the historical society and and saw uh your display on african-american uh you know history in in oregon and portland etc and i thought it was really interesting um and it was not that long after that that the black lives matter thing happened and i saw the attacks on the, on um, the building, et cetera. And I didn't even know about them, the stealing of, the, of that quilt. That's amazing as well. And I was really surprised that they had such a negative uh, reaction uh, toward that 
toward that institution. I, I, was, I was amazed and I was wondering if what your kind of feeling was or what your questions were or if you've gotten any answers to the questions about, about why they chose that institution to attack. Well, uh, again, good question. And obviously, you know, we were attacked on 2020 on Columbus Day, which, which they called the Indigenous Nation Day of Rage. And of course, it shows you that how little they really knew of what we, we did. I mean, they, uh, you know, every, uh, all nine of the federally recognized tribes, you know, afterwards said, you know, these weren't our people. These people know nothing. We, you know, we're so proud of what you do at OHS. It, we were just in the wrong place at the, at the, you know, the wrong time. Uh, we were, uh, another guy vandalized us and, and spray painted no more history on our outside wall as if that's, you know, solution. We need more history. We don't need no more history. Um, it's, you know, it's sad, you know, they, you know, why do they attack Starbucks? Why do they attack, the same night they attacked us, they attacked the Blazers Boys and Girls Club in a church that helps the homeless. I mean, it was just completely, for no reason at all. Um, that share a little secret with you though. I mean, the, the outpouring of support that came after we were attacked was so encouraging and so uh, heartening. Uh, I, I've been joking that if I'd known we would have gotten that much support, I would have broken those dang windows 20 years ago. So just, just a joke. So. <laughs> a question from Jerry. Uh says, does, o, does OHS offer workshops for individuals who are wanting to develop fam, family history archives? Yes, we, we did and we will again. Uh, we did offer genealogy workshops and archives like that. Of course, again, those have been cut down because of the uh, pandemic, but you know, knock wood, uh, my motto for the last two years has been think positive and test negative. And so I, I will continue to think positive and, you know, Hopefully this later this spring, early this summer, things will be uh, more back to normal and we'll be able to do public workshops again. I have another question as we wait for others to come in. Uh, obviously during the Trump administration and leading up to the election and through the election, Portland was really a national centerpiece for some things that happened. And does OHS have guidelines for how long it waits uh, before telling history? Uh, good, good question. We, uh, you know, we, as far as artifacts, you know, we got a lot of protest signs, uh, that type of thing were, were donated to us after these protests, which we'll keep in our collection. Uh, we, we've done a lot of programs uh, and lectures on, on the election, uh, the protests on, you know, on history. Uh, so, we, you know, we are a 501c3. We try not to be political uh, and again we're, we, we just report on on the on the facts and, and on history but uh, we, we're proud to say that the, the Willamette Week called us the most anti-racist museum in the country uh, I'll take that anytime you know uh, I'm, we're, 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 we're proud of that um, yeah and again I as I say again uh, you know never before has truth been under assault as it has been the last couple of years? Again, on a on a personal note, and I'm speaking as Carrie Timtek person. Uh, obviously, given who I worked for, uh, Mark Hatfield, Bob Dole, Gordon Smith, I was a big squishy middle of the road uh, Main Street, you know, uh, Mark Republican. Um, when Trump got the nomination 2016, five years ago, I immediately re-registered as unaffiliated. Uh, I ended up being the co-chair of the Biden campaign in Oregon in 2020. Uh, so, uh, you know where my uh, philosophy lies there over the last 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 years, and just how um, how unbelievable it is that the number of people who uh, believe that red is blue and and you know the grass is not green who who think that the election was stolen when of course it was not. Um, our next question comes from one of our frequent MCs, Helen Christians. She will unmute for this. With, with the school boards and parental rights in the schools and all these books that are being banned in parts of the country, 
I'm just wondering, how is the Oregon um, Historical Society dealing with people that, that don't agree with your openness uh, to, to tell many people's stories? Uh, well, you know, they're welcome to cancel their membership, which a few people did. Uh, really? they're, wel they're welcome to not come. I mean, again, I, we're not the we're not the Chamber of Commerce and we're not the Tourism Bureau. We're the Historic Society. And uh, I appreciate you mentioned school boards. My wonderful wife is uh, on the Beaverton School Board. Oh my! Been, and yes, you can imagine the fun that that's been yeah. <laughs> the last couple of years. Oh uh, at least it's not the Newburgh School Board she's on. No. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, tell your wife, thank you for her good work. And uh, I'm sure there's been many days she's thought about resigning. Well, yeah. yeah, you know, and, and all for a, you know, for a volunteer job, too. Yeah, so. right, right. Well, th well, thanks for your good work. And thanks for not uh, just saying you're welcome to disagree, but uh, we're not changing our ways. So. Exactly. So. Yeah. yeah, very good. Thank you. I'll read a question from uh, Joyce Lackey. Joyce writes, what is the most controversial issue that the society has had to deal with over the years, in your opinion? Well, I would, I would say one now that, uh, that we are not directly involved in, but people ask our opinion, are the statues. Uh, the, you know, obviously, the, as, you, as you know, during the, the vandalism, the statues around the city were knocked down. The elk was knocked down. Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln in the park directly across from us, um, Harvey Scott over in the, on the east side. In our opinion on, uh, you know, on what you should do in, with, with statues like that. Uh, again, um, we, it's, a, it's a good thing for us and we think it's a healthy thing for people to talk about history anytime. And so I, I enjoy having people de debate history. Uh, we don't have an official viewpoint on the statues. We just provide the information. Here's, here's what Abraham Lincoln did and didn't do. Here's what Teddy Roosevelt did and didn't do. Uh, leave it up to others to make the decision on whether they should ha have a, a statue or whether it should be put back up or um, I have personal opinions, but the OHS uh, doesn't have an institution opinion. Just again, providing the history to the people who are interested about it. Kathy Moyd would like to unmute with a question. Hi, Carrie. Um, I was wondering, uh, this is kind of a follow on to the how long do you wait before you uh, consider something history? And obviously, one of the key things is going to be the activities during the Black Lives Matter and the uh, and the violence in Portland and how how you're to so are already working on it. But when do you think you might have something and how do you present it in a fair way that doesn't right. make everybody think that Portland was burning down. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're working on now. It's a very, very timely question because we are in the midst of uh, one of the, uh, not a pledge, but uh, because of the support we get from Multnomah County uh, over these last, these last 10 years. And, and a request we often get from visitors to the museum was, is there an exhibit about the history of Portland? Uh, so we are using one of our galleries uh, to change to, 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 to build a permanent exhibit on the history of the city of Portland. Uh, it'll be completed, I believe, in 2023. Uh, we're going through the process now of reaching out to all interested people and parties to, uh, to talk with us about what should be an exhibit, what shouldn't be an exhibit. Uh, you know, so it'll be, uh, and, and obviously we're going to have to deal with these last couple of years. Um, and and what's ahead for Portland in the future? So that's a question we're we're, we're dealing with right now. Uh, so stay tuned <laughs> as to uh, as to what happens there. We do have right when you come into the museum on the wall is the in a case is the Portland penny. Uh, Portland famously got its name in a coin flip back in the 1840s. Oh. Uh, two early settlers, Asa Lovejoy and Francis Pettigrove, uh, plotted out. The original city, which was kind of called Stumptown, you know, was the nickname back then. Uh, Lovejoy was from Boston. He wanted to name it Boston. And Pettigrove was from Portland, Maine, wanted to name it Portland. And so unable to decide, the story goes, they flipped this coin, two out of three. Uh, and thankfully, Portland won. Uh, mm -hmm. We never would have been the biggest Boston, but we're the biggest Portland. And 
So we're, we're also a port. And right next to the penny is the dollar bill that meant the most to, to me. You know, we've received obviously a very a lot of generous contributions over the years, some seven-figure contributions. This dollar bill was awaiting me the morning after our attack when I went down to survey the damage, the every window broken, glad, shattered glass all over the floor. Uh, a, a flare had been thrown into the building and you know, burned some carpet. Uh, the African-American quilt you know, kidnapped. Uh, but there uh, would have been very easily to, easy to be really depressed. But there waiting me for me was a dollar bill and a napkin and written on the napkin uh, was a note uh, that says, hello, my name is Oscar. I am homeless. You once gave me a tour of your building. And so I saw the damage and I wanted, this is from my bottle deposit money and I wanted you to have it to, do, to help repair the damage. So uh, I framed that dollar and it's in, a, it's in a frame on the wall right next to the Portland penny, so. That's an amazing story. I like that story. A lot of people reached out, wanted to know if they could help Oscar. Uh, and we reached out to Oscar and said, hey, people want, would like to help. And he declined. Uh, he just wanted to remain more or less anonymous. So, Yes, I um, just recently happened to acquire this little thing, which is uh, small, about the size of a pack of cigarettes, but it costs even more. Um, it's a it's a portable recorder that takes excellent recordings, and I thought I might might since I own it might use some of its spare time to collect oral history. Do you have any advice for somebody who wants to do that about how to do it well, uh, or do you do you offer any kind of training in that sort of thing, oh. or do you, can you recommend something? something to, to, to read or whatever to, to do, learn how I'll, to do that. I, I'll ask my, my staff on that, but we have a phenomenal oral history collection uh, in which you can access a lot of it digitally uh, on, our, on our website. Uh, and, I, and on Senator Hatfield's birthday, we will open up his, his oral history uh, that uh -huh. he gave us. He, he had uh, been agreed upon that it would be open upon his 100th birthday. And so, wow. but just, and, uh, we use a lot of, there are those who are trained in oral histories, know how to ask the quite right questions. Uh, so, but if you, are you thinking of doing one yourself or of other people or? Yeah, maybe interviewing people. I don't know. We got a lot of old people in the humanists. I thought maybe I could start with them just to, so, to try to, to figure out if it was worthwhile to try to do this kind of thing. Of course, and once you have an oral history, you have to do a transcript of it as well, which is <laughs> which you have someone listening to it and transcribing well, it. So. Who wrote that rule? Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> Let's take it. I'll tear down his statue. Oh. <laughs> there, there are some amazing programs to uh, transcribe uh, oral histories uh, into written transcripts now. So uh, technology has really improved in that area. Well, the library, you know, they aren't the repository that, that we are. Uh, we do work with the city of Portland, the state of Oregon. Official government records are kept by the, you know, by the city, by the state, um, by the county. Uh, so we have Black History Month. We have Holocaust Memorial Day. Hmm. We have a host of similar observ uh, observances that are built into the calendar of the year. Why am I bringing this up? Our children who we consider informed, ethically, morally, don't know the essence of tragedies from Native Americans to the Asiatics, to the uh, Jews, to the Blacks. They, they, they have a sense of it and they do what they have to. But somehow that information, and it's from your source, doesn't filter down into their DNA. What is it that doesn't allow us to finally learn from history what we don't do the next time around? Mm -hmm. What are we lacking as a species that don't allow us to do that? Well, that's above my pay grade, but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there are you know the here in Oregon the legislature has passed some laws just last session requiring this to, to be taught in our schools. Uh, and the school districts are already reaching out to us for curriculum. And we just got a wonderful grant from the Murdoch Foundation 
uh, we're going to be able to hire an ethnic studies educator uh, at OHS to Great. write curriculum for all the schools in Oregon when it when it comes to, and one of them was Holocaust. They passed a bill requiring Holocaust education. Uh, so we will be reaching out to all our school districts over the next couple of years. It was a three year grant to provide curriculum on Holocaust, on indigenous nation, on racism. Um, yeah, you, you, yes. Well, that's very encouraging. Yeah. Good, so. I'm so glad that is the case. Yeah, I appreciate that. You bet. And Carrie, you. your, your answer on uh, archives and working with the Multnomah County Library got interrupted with some background noise. So uh, can you? Uh, yeah, we just we kind of have you know different mi different missions. Uh, uh, you know, they don't keep as obviously the archives, the history that that we do. Uh, but uh, we, we work, as I said, with the state archives, with, with the county, with the, with the city, to make sure that someone's keeping, uh, keeping the right records and the history that needs to be kept. Sounds good. We have a comment all the way from India and Ranga. Oh, boy. I was really surprised to learn recently that during the internment of the Japanese after the World War at Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government even persuaded the South American countries like Peru and other things to also intern the Japanese there, Japanese origin people there. And not only that, the U.S. military brought them to USA and interned them here. Mm -hmm. But the ironical thing is after the world war, war was over, where they were all liberated, then these people who were brought by the U.S. military, they were called illegal aliens undocumented. Mm -hmm. next, next week is the uh, 80th anniversary of the executive order that President Roosevelt signed in uh, you know, February or of, 2020, of 1942, creating yes. the, the internment policy. Uh, we'll be doing some, uh, some outreach on, on, on that issue. Uh, I would encourage you all, uh, we have a great weekly e-blast that goes out every Thursday to subscribers, which now are over 20,000 people. Uh, and with a really a lot of fun, interesting, fascinating history. Uh, it's free. If you go to our website, uh, www.ohs.org, on the bottom of the, the first page, you'll see a thing, sign up for the e-blast. Would, would encourage you all to do that. You'll, you, you'll love what you get every Thursday. Sounds great. I think that's a great resource to end our Q&A. Carrie, thank you so much for a lively Q&A, an outstanding presentation, and for the amazing work you're doing at OHS. Well, thank you. I would encourage you all. I'm, gonna, I'm headed down there soon to be there for part of our birthday weekend. I would encourage you all to, to come in uh, whenever, you, whenever you can.